Um, so I'm going to try and hit it kind of at an intermediate level, knowing that most of you have context, some of you quite a lot of context about the Buddhist tradition and how the mind works. Um, I think it's interesting to kind of pull in some parallels from science, pull in some uh, parallels, particularly from neuroscience, maybe psychology. So um, it'll be an interesting course, but if you're having topics related to consciousness that you really want to go into, um, please do make suggestions too, because I'm happy to be flexible. So um, we'll go ahead and start by setting our motivation. So just take a minute, feel grounded in your space, grounded in your seat, present in your body. and refuge in bodhicitta. Sangye chudon sogi chunam lai dan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ge pe sonam ki rola pen chi sangye jupa sho sangye chudon sogi chunam la dan chu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola penji sangge drupa sho Sangge churun sogi chunam la Jan chu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola penji sangge drupa sho and so thinking very deeply that we go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, taking safe direction from them. And we do this in order to become enlightened. And the reason for full enlightenment is in order to benefit all sentient beings. And so in particular, we need to understand what stands in the way of benefiting sentient beings and what facilitates our progress on the path. To that end, we particularly look at consciousness. Okay. All right, so I'll start with just some basic stuff to make sure that we're all on the same page. So some of this you guys are very familiar with and some, for a couple people it might be new, but just kind of like to get your consciousness category of teachings nicely reorganized and tidy in your head before we kind of go any further. So, um, so I'm going to hit you with a PowerPoint, but it won't be too PowerPointy, don't worry. Okay, so classic, why are we doing this? Okay, so there are two reasons why it is important to understand the nature of the mind. One is because there is an intimate connection between mind and karma. And the other is that our state of mind plays a crucial role in our experiences of happiness and suffering. So this might be self-evident, but just to remind ourselves that it's a fun topic regardless of the reason, just what is consciousness, how does it work? But for us as Buddhist practitioners or Buddhist enthusiasts, depending on how we identify, there's this very deep connection with how is it that happiness and suffering come about? And what is the relationship with the mind to those? And so then classically, we have this quote from the Buddha, the mind is the forerunner of all evil conditions. Mind is chief and they are mind made. If with an impure mind one speaks or acts, then pain follows one, even as the wheel follows the hoof of the ox. Mind is the forerunner of all good conditions. Mind is chief, and they are mind made. If with a pure mind one speaks or acts, then happiness follows one, even as the shadow that never leaves. And so, here is the phrase you hear again and again whenever consciousness comes up, that the nature of consciousness is clear and knowing. Occasionally translators will say clarity and awareness or luminosity and awareness, but this is what you hear 
all the time when we start the conversation about consciousness. And it sounds really lovely and so tidy and finite, but what does that mean? So when you hear the words, consciousness is clear and knowing, what does that convey to you? What's the immediate impression you have about the nature of mind when you hear it's clear and knowing? Whether it's a scholastic answer or like an experiential answer, what does it mean to you? It means something idealistic to me because my mind is not clear and knowing. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> right? That's a very, it's really important to start there because you think, is it? <laughs> right? Surely not. <laughs> Have you seen my mind? <laughs> Right? Or, oh no, is it just me? Oh no, right? Yeah, so that's one that comes up, clear and knowing. Yeah, is, um, I'm not sure that's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe it's the idealized form. Yeah, that's one that comes up for sure. <laughs> yeah, what, what else comes up when you hear that phrasing? Without afflictions and omniscient? Right, right. It sort of conveys a sense of the goal rather than the current situation. That's, that's what it sounds like, whether that's what it means. It certainly sounds like that, yeah. Yeah, it, so it can convey this sense of um, that it's already perfect. It's already done and dusted. Our work here is done. And you think, great, wait, I'm suffering though. What, why? But I have clear and knowing awareness. Do I? No, I don't. Maybe some people do. It, it can kind of get you in this weird tangle because it's not very specific about what is meant by those terms or what's being invited of us by sharing it in that way. Yeah, D does anyone remember kind of what technically it means, clear and knowing? Or um, even in just ordinary language, something about what is it supposed to mean when we use these words in Buddhism? It's capable of reflecting um, our environment and um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I mean, I, there's another part to that, but that's what comes to mind right away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's that aspect of reflective, that's spot on. Yep. There's something about the clarity and awareness that conveys reflective ability. Uh, hence why we use that analogy sometimes of the sky reflective or water reflective uh, to describe the way the mind is. Absolutely reflective is one piece. Does, do, does anyone else remember other pieces of what it actually means? I think of an enlightened mind. Mm. Yeah, you go straight to the finished product too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is inspiring, right? It's inspiring. Yeah. Straight to the end. Yeah. But what do you think it means when we say our mind has the aspect of clarity and awareness, even though you feel foggy, even though you're not feeling particularly aware? What does it mean about your own mind? That's, in, that's the piece we want to really look at. Because they're not saying that the Buddha's mind is clear and knowing. They're saying all consciousnesses are clear and knowing. And so there must be something meant by that that is more than just the connotations we have in everyday life. I would say potential. Potential, yeah. There's something in there that's important, yeah. That because it's clear and knowing, there's a potentiality there. And that, that's a very important piece. The ability to cognize an object. Now you're, now you're hitting the good terms, yes. <laughs> right. And of course, John knows, but you know, he's helping out the team. <laughs> cognize. How do you understand the word cognize, John? I'm curious. How do you frame that word just kind of conversationally to cognize? Mm -hmm. um, well, it goes back to what you originally said about knowing. Yeah. Just to know the object. Yep. And that knowing, it can have that problematic feeling of knowing seems to mean accurately, but it doesn't necessarily mean accurately. So it's an interesting word. It's a really interesting word. Look, it's, it's sometimes it's just like it's the beginning and the end of the whole conversation. Mind is clear and knowing and we don't go any further with it. And I, and I think it's worth unpacking it. Um, so of course I've got nice tidy technical definitions to throw at you, but I think to kind of get it warmed up in your head of what have we heard our lamas say? 
what's the sense they're trying to bring to us when they're talking about this topic? And given that information, what do we do with it today? Um, the knowing part always makes me think of computers. Right. I mean, my computer can do all sorts of math far better than I can. But when I, when I add two and two, I know I'm adding two and two. My computer does it. There's no one home. Yeah, that it has that sentient con connotation. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Like self-aware while doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And there are a lot of conversations about that with artificial intelligence lately, aren't there? Like what's going to be the point at which we call artificial intelligence sentience? What's the point at which we can say it has consciousness? Will we ever be able to say that? And if it has consciousness, is it the same way of defining all other forms of consciousness? And it becomes kind of an intriguing conversation. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna get a little bit technical, but then we're gonna go back to conversational and just try and get it into some sort of framework that it feels tangible to us or somehow within our own lived experience, we can touch the essence of what is meant here. Synonyms, this is important because otherwise we get tangled. So the terms cognition, consciousness and awareness are synonymous in this context, okay? So when you hear one, it means the same as the others in this context. The nature of cognition or consciousness or awareness is stated to be awareness, and the nature of consciousness is said to be clear or luminous and aware. And this clear or luminous thing, I think this footnote is helpful. It says the Tibetan term translated as clear Although the Sanskrit term means luminous, the Tibetan term also conveys a sense of being clear or pellucid. I, of course, I'm gonna slaughter that word. So it's when you, when you hear clear and you hear luminous, it's two aspects of talking about the same basic quality. And we'll go more into that in a sec, but you'll hear it described in different ways. Um, particularly in the Nyingma tradition, they like the word luminous and they use the word luminous more. In the Gaelic tradition, we're, we're more prone to use the word clear. So clear expresses the essential nature of consciousness and aware expresses its function. Okay, clear equals nature, aware equals function. Okay, kind of holding that, then we're going to weave a little bit more detail in. Clear also indicates that consciousness is beyond the nature of matter, which is characterized as tangible and obstructive. So consciousness is clear in nature. And then what, um, what we were talking about before, that just as reflections appear in a mirror, any internal or external object whatsoever, good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, can appear in consciousness. So here's where we're really talking about what is the clarity described? It's not talking about accuracy or inaccuracy, it's talking about a reflective ability, like water or like a mirror. And then the, if we're gonna use the word luminous, that's conveying a slightly different sense or a slightly more full sense in the sense that it illuminates objects. The essential nature of consciousness is not contaminated by the stains of mental afflictions, such as attachment. So its nature is clear or luminous. So several meanings of the word clear are stated in the texts. Luminously clear, we could say in that any internal or external object whatsoever can appear in it, this is explained as follows. So just as sunlight or electric light illuminates form, any external or internal phenomena can be illuminated by it. That is, they can appear to it, consciousness. It is what makes objects known or manifest. Yet, the illumination of sunlight or electric light and the luminous clarity that is essential nature of consciousness are utterly dissimilar. 
for sunlight and electric light illuminate only what is in their immediate vicinity and cannot illuminate other things. In that way, consciousness illuminates objects is not restricted in that way. Okay, so we're just talking about this word clear and um, you know whether we're translating it as clarity or luminosity, what we're talking about is a reflective aspect. So if you hear the word luminous, don't feel like the mind has like a light quality, like it's gonna like turn on an actual light. It's, it's that the mind has the ability to hold objects within it. The mind has the ability to apprehend things. And that's what it's doing all day, every day to varying degrees of accuracy, engaging with those objects in varying degrees of helpful or unhelpful. Yeah. Yeah, there was a question. Go ahead. Can you, um, can you, can you explain what's meant by internal objects and how the mind are, or how consciousness can illuminate internal objects? Yeah, yeah. And the word object is always tricky just itself because it has a sense of something kind of physical or tangible. Like we'll say a meditation object. It's an object of the mind. It's an imagined thing. So it's kind of like object for lack of a better word. So a mental object would be any number of things happening within your mental consciousness, whether it's love or compassion or anger or the idea of an elephant or the memory of a poem. It's anything that arises within the mind you could call a mental object. And that's different than consciousness? It it's what the like... consciousness is holding, but you could call it also consciousness. Right, so it sounds, but it sounds like you're saying consciousness has the ability to illuminate itself. And that's where you get into fun conversations within the philosophical tenet schools. Yeah. And, um, and what you're describing is very akin to the mind only school of the philosophical tenet schools. So I'm not gonna say yes or no in a precise way because it's only the beginning of the conversation, but you start to see the tangle that we get into. It, are we just in an echo chamber of our own thoughts, talking to each other? Is there any external world at all anyway? What is happening? Yeah, what is, what is actually existent? What is creating experience? So a mental object can be from a middle way consequence school view, which is the school of thought that our tradition usually speaks from, more on that later, from our point of view, there are external objects and external objects can be one of the conditions that like triggers or is a catalyst for an internal experience. But the way in which it's a catalyst for an internal experience isn't just it's only it's the only condition for it. There also has to be what the mind is bringing to it. So to make it, I guess, kind of simple. We would say, um, if you see a picture of a picture of the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, right? And you're someone who grew up with a Western education, you have a whole series of associations of what that painting is and means, whether you've decided you like it or you don't like it, your feelings about the artist, et cetera, et cetera. So you're seeing something visually, but then all of your mental conditioning is coming together with that and informing how it's viewed. But if you'd never seen that painting before and never grew up in, with a Western education, you'd have a very different set of experiences when meeting that same image. But you know, there's a, a spectrum of variation of people who have never seen it and people who have seen it, they all are having unique experiences of seeing it, despite it being the same picture, right? So there is an external object which is important piece of your inner experience, but everyone's inner experience is so different because of what we're bringing to that moment of visual form. Yeah. So it's a little can of wormsy, but we'll, we'll unpack it. <laughs> we'll unpack it. And it's, it's a fun kind of process to dig into. Yeah. But does that kind of roughly make sense about what a mental object is? An object of the mind. Yeah, so consciousness is the big category, if that helps, the umbrella category. Within that, there are many different types of consciousness. 
and we could call them main minds and mental factors and we'll come back to that but that's why you use that analogy of the sky and the clouds so often when talking about consciousness the main minds we think of as spacious able to hold and reflect they're a little bit less judgmental a little bit less moving for lack of a better word the mental factors are more like clouds or weather changing more quickly giving more color and impression to experience but more on that soon and of course if you have any additions of ways other teachers have explained this that you found particularly clear please share because we can make this really collaborative as well so would a thought be an internal object yes okay. yep yeah exactly yeah, exactly all right so when you hear clarity think reflective hey that's the easiest way clarity luminosity think reflective but just because something is reflected doesn't mean it's understood yeah just because it's re reflected doesn't mean it's understood it may be and it has the ability to be but it doesn't mean that it is so then just a quote from sutra because it's nice to have a quote from sutra um, this quote is addressed to Manjushri. Manjushri, the mind is luminous clarity by nature, not afflicted by nature. Therefore, since all the afflictions are adventitious, all the afflictions are removable. Anything that is just luminous clarity by nature is unafflicted. So this can start to sound circular or contradictory, but it's not there's a lot woven into a passage like this. So the first one to look at is the word adventitious, which is an aggravating word that Buddhist scholars use, and it will keep coming up. So I will also use it so that you don't trip up on it when you see it in the future. It just means extra. Yeah, adventitious just means extra or like additional. Yeah, it's a fancy way of saying that this, despite the fact that anger and attachment and all sorts of disturbing emotions arise within your mind, they are additional to the nature of the mind. They're not fundamental to it. They can be removed from it. Yeah, so coming back to like the mind as water analogy, sometimes I'll use the mind as water analogy, sometimes the mind as sky analogy, they both have that reflective quality. But in this sense, think about the way in which water has water molecules that are H2O, and water by itself always reflects, but if there's dirt in the water, it doesn't do it well. But it doesn't mean that the particles have lost their ability to do it, just because there's also mud there right nothing has ruined the molecules it's just there's a covering that's making them less functional in the sense of their reflective ability so really do think of the afflictions negative states of mind disturbing emotions think of them like mud in the water right and don't identify with the mud but acknowledge that it's there you know it's carried there with the water so if you want the water to be clearer there needs to be methods to get rid of the mud, right? Classic tale. And so when you hear the word adventitious, think the mud can come out. Think goodness, the mud can come out and the clarity can reassert itself in a more vivid degree. So anything that is just luminous clarity by nature is unafflicted and this is to say that the mind in its essence is not permeated by the afflictions and this is where these kind of passages are what sometimes make people confused about what is buddha nature what is buddha potential and it feels like you're already a buddha you just have to wake up to it or something simple like that and what's really being said is that the mind's ability to transform has always been there and will always be there until the transformation is complete, right? The mind's ability to grow into its potential of full compassion, full loving kindness, ability, wisdom, etc., omniscience, right? That ability to grow into is not going to be lost. The potential of the mind to do that can't be ruined. 
has always been there. But that doesn't mean it's been done yet, right? It's not done yet. So there are kind of two types of Buddha nature. We could call the natural purity of the mind and the adventitious or additional purity of the mind. The natural purity of the mind is the fact that the mind lacks inherent existence. And the mind has always lacked inherent existence, which means it's always been workable. You're not stuck with what you've got, yeah? Your good qualities can be grown, your negative qualities can be dismissed, yeah? So there's a workability in the mind that it's this natural abiding Buddha potential. But then it's adventitious purity or it's additional or in um, working Buddha nature, lots of translations, means that you have to do something with that mind for it to become omniscient. So you have the practices of method and the practices of wisdom to grow into a full Buddha, to actualize the full potential of this mind. So, you know, it can kind of sound like this is a really long project, but it kind of boils down to first sitting with asking yourself, is change possible? Is change possible for you? Have you changed? Are you changing? Do you believe that an evolution of your mind can be in some way self-directed? And when you take a step back and kind of look at your life, sometimes it can feel like you've always been this way, right? For better or for worse, you've always been this way. It's just details that have changed and experiences that have been added, but somehow it feels like you're the same child on the playground who made these kind of friends and didn't understand these kind of kids and were loved by these ones and bullied by those ones and was good at this and bad at that. And you're somehow still that little kid on the playground who's just learned a few more things and gotten a taller, stiffer body, right? But it sometimes feels that way, like you've never changed really fundamentally. And that is an illusion. That's a, that's a grasping at permanence problem that we need to look at, but you can't talk over the top of it feeling that way. And if you take something like your tendency towards anger or your tendency towards depression, or your tendency towards anxiety, it can feel like that's a tendency that will be here forever because so far it has. And maybe your ability to regulate and manage it has gotten more skillful or more socially acceptable or less, right? But it feels like those kind of like core traits are core traits. Do you agree it feels that way despite hearing Buddhist teachings about impermanence, despite hearing Buddhist teachings about self? It's hard to let go of this feeling like there's some solid bits, just experientially, right? So intellectually, you know better, philosophically, you know better, but experientially, there's stuck spots. Does it feel that way sometimes, right? And, and so we don't wanna talk over the top of our own experience. We wanna to speak to that experience and address it, yeah? And ask ourselves, have there been chapters in the life where we were once kind of one way and then actually did shift to another way through habits, through changes of circumstance, through support, through whatever? And the easiest way to remember is to think of when you've learned. Yeah, we once couldn't read, now we can read. Yes, that's a change that's happened. That's a, that's a knowing we've developed. We once couldn't speak, now we can speak. It's like a miracle. We once couldn't walk, now we can walk. We might lose the ability to walk, but we had a few good days in there, you know, a few good decades. There's all these things about how we once functioned in the world that are actually quite different. And then we ask ourselves how much of that was just kind of by chance and kind of just experiences over a lifetime change you and how much of that was self-directed. And then that becomes a little bit trickier because sometimes it feels like we're just responding to life and adjusting based on what's happening to us rather than what's happening from us. 
and either perspective has its argument for what's more significant, but I think it's more empowering to choose to look at what can happen from me and what's a pace that's sustainable and practical given the conditioning this mind already has. So the mind has been conditioned a certain way. You're not gonna magically change it overnight. You might as well go with the parts of your conditioning that are flowing in a helpful direction. And the parts of your conditioning that have obstacles to enlightenment to them, you're not identifying with them as you. It's like just bits of mud that got stuck here, but you don't identify as the mud. Yeah, my, my Australian friends who I see in Zoom cubes, they know I love the analogy of skin cancer, right? When you get skin cancer, you don't think, oh, my little skin cancer, don't take it off. Don't take it off. It's me. It's part of me. No, you think, freeze it off. Get it off. Get it off quick. Don't let it spread, right? And we need to think of the afflictions like this. Like it grew here. It was formed from the cells here. In a sense, it came from me in one sense, but it came from an afflicted part and it came from a removable aspect. Just because it grew here doesn't mean it's me or mine or should stay. Think of it like a skin cancer that many conditions came together. Some of it was genetics. We could think some of it was karma. Some of it was conditioning, right? It came about here and then I met the sunshine and then I was in Australia too many years and then whatever, burn it off, freeze it off, get rid of it. If someone said, no, 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 this skin cancer is part of me. It's part of me and, you know, love me, love my skin cancer. You would think that they were a little bit cuckoo, yes? But we are kind of like, love me, love my anger. Love me, love my depression. As it, like it's the same thing. And, there, you know, this is a problem because your anger is like skin cancer. Yes. <laughs> you came by it honest. You're not bad for having it. However, letting it stay is like poison and it can spread and it can get worse. Freeze it off. Or we would say, warm it off from loving kindness and patience and the wisdom realizing emptiness. Let it dissolve naturally. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be this like aggressive thing, but to really change the way you think about your own afflictions is very important. So you have Buddha nature of two types, yes? <laughs> you have the, what's there naturally, which you don't have to do anything about, which is just good news. And then you have the part that you've got to work on. But you can never ruin the fact that you have the potential for enlightenment, no matter how distracted or afflicted you get. Thank goodness. So then the question becomes, is the mind the brain? Or meaning, is the mind material or immaterial? So we want to hold open the question. You know, if you've been around Buddhism, you know that we believe the mind is not material, that the mind is not the brain. But yet we also know what scientists say about neuroplasticity, about psychology, about the way the brain and the nervous system function. And we can't pretend there's not an effect on our experience. So just because you know the answer Buddhism is pointing to, again, doesn't mean you need to force yourself to believe that before you're ready. Okay, so a happy medium, I think, can be to think that the mind is immaterial, but it uses the brain, the nervous system, the gut biome, <laughs> the whatever is influencing our experience, right? It uses those things, it permeates those things, but it is not those things. But because we have a human body, and a human brain, the mind has a functionability that is superior to when that very same mind is in an animal body with an animal brain. And we've been in an animal body with an animal brain. And it's not like we were at the same capacity as when we're in a human form. You have your animal impulses. The last time you were a dog, you sniffed other dogs. You weren't like some sort of superior dog, like human, human person in a dog brain. No, you were just a dog doing dog things. And when you were a hungry ghost, you did hungry ghost things. Whatever realm your mind enters into is in a way trapped by the confines of that karmic body. 
So the fact that this mind is in a human body with a human brain means that there's a lot more potential for development and learning, which is why it's such a precious thing. So if you think, oh, I really wanna be reborn as a house cat. No, you won't remember all the stuff that you did as a human. You might remember some of it the next time you're a human or they'll feel familiar. You know, there'll be a familiarity with things, but uh, it's not like you'll suddenly have that same awareness in this different body or this different rebirth. So we take some stuff that we learn about neuroplasticity or about how the brain works, about mirror neurons, about all this stuff that is really quite intriguing. And then we put it next to the Buddhist idea that basically the mind will do whatever you train it to do. Through habituation, patterns form and deepen. And that goes perfectly together with the, you know, the neurons that wire, fire together, wire together. Yeah, and that through repetition, new neural pathways are formed. So because those are learnings that are in sync with each other, we can use methods of both to go in a good direction. Sometimes there will come a point where there is maybe dissonance. For example, when you talk to psychologists, some schools of psychology believe that we are the result of our conditioning only, or the result of our genetics only, or both, but there may be some sort of core, or there might not be. The ego is finite and permanent, or not at all whatsoever. There's huge variations in what psychologists think the self is. Sometimes, it's similar to the Buddhist idea of self. Sometimes it isn't. So then if you're asking yourself about your own suffering and getting rid of your own suffering, will strategies that are from a completely different worldview help release you? Maybe, maybe not. But it's, it's worth an investigation, isn't it? Yeah? So it's not to say that there aren't other ways for us to get rid of suffering besides Buddhist techniques, but when we're using things that are not Buddhist techniques, we want to ask what worldview are they coming from and what goal are they putting in their mind? Yeah, what's the, what's the aim? Some, sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, health and well-being. And you want to say, health and well-being to what end? <laughs> for what? For itself? Maybe, okay, that's good. For more, who knows? But these are the deep questions we wanna ask ourselves when bringing all of this conversation about mind to our experience of happiness and suffering. What can we use from different schools of thought and what are not going far enough? So these are just open questions, right? You don't have to come to a conclusion, in fact, I think it's helpful to try not to come to a conclusion too soon and just kind of have it open and spacious because we have a lot of information in our heads, but not tons of wisdom sometimes, right? Information and wisdom don't always go together. So just kind of like give all of the information you know about science and Buddhism some space, some airtime and see what collaborates internally and kind of integrates. And then what pieces you feel a real dissonance with, because then sometimes that's the gateway to truth, when you can kind of nail down your stuck spots. So if while you're listening to these things, you're remembering old doubts that you had, do bring them up. So whatever position we hold, that the mind is material or immaterial, in general, what we call consciousness is known to exist based on experience. Right? So it does not necessarily need to be proved through reasoning. So nevertheless, there are many types of subtle mental states that must be proved through reasoning. And just to you know, reinforce this really important quote from the Buddha, he says, do not accept my dharma merely out of respect for me, but analyze and check it the way a goldsmith analyzes gold by burning cutting and rubbing it. 
So how are we examining? There are three types of phenomena that are known by a specific type of reliable cognizer, sometimes translated as valid cognition. So these are types of consciousness that are more accurate than our afflictions. Our afflictions, our disturbing emotions, they are not accurate. They sometimes have useful information, but they are not true. Anger says harm makes sense. That's not true, right? But it arises and it's vivid and visceral, so it feels like truth. We want to really identify the difference between reliable cognition and unreliable cognition. So in order to do that first, we're just going to look at the different kinds of phenomena that mind can hold. So first we have evident or manifest phenomena. We have slightly obscure or hidden phenomena and very obscure or extremely hidden phenomena. So I'm putting two translations that are very common, but know that it means the same thing when there's that slash there. Okay, so first evident or manifest phenomena. So this is our life basically is manifest phenomena. It's what ordinary beings like us can easily perceive. So colors, sounds, odors, tastes, tangible objects, which are known by direct reliable cognizers that correspond to our five physical senses, right? Like eyes, ears, nose, right? And then also internal objects, such as feelings of happiness, pain, hopes, and desires which are all known by the mental consciousness. Okay, so manifest phenomena knows these things of, from everyday life. This is just our ordinary everyday life. And then slightly obscure or hidden phenomena, they must be initially known by a factual inferential cognizer. So an inferential reliable cognizer based on a valid factual reasons. So this needs examples to understand, okay? So just kind of, you know, gently, gently. So examples of slightly obscure phenomena are subtle impermanence, the momentary arising and ceasing of conditioned things, and selflessness. So the fact that the apple arises in dependence on causes and conditions is part of the conventional nature of the apple through understanding that its existence is the result of causes and conditions, we can come to know that the apple is impermanent. So we can't see subtle change, but through examination, through logic, we start to understand the hidden phenomena of things. Uh, the sun setting in the west is a course change that is evident to our visual sense, but to understand the sun's subtle changeable nature, we must use reasoning. The sun rose in the east, and in order to set in the west, it must move continuously, moment by moment, imperceptibly across the sky. This momentary change cannot be detected by our eyes. We need reasoning to know it. So you look up at the sky at 8 a.m., and then you look up the sky at 11 a.m., the sun is moved. Right? You don't think that it appeared and disappeared and appeared and disappeared. You're making a logical conclusion based on some experience, but also hugely reasoning. So to know like slightly obscure phenomena such as selflessness, for example, the absence of a permanent independent soul or self, we might use the reason of dependence and think of a syllogism Consider a person. She does not exist as a permanent, partless, under its own power, soul, or self, because she depends on her body and mind. Okay, so before we get into extremely subtle, I'll just sit with that for a sec. So when we're talking about subtle phenomena, they, you can, uh, you can come to know them, right? You can come to know them, but the way you come to know them is through thinking. Yes, thinking deeply, thinking accurately, thinking based in logic, and then it opens up to you and you can have a deep conviction in something that's true that you cannot perceivably see with your senses. Yeah, yeah, like the sun setting and how the sun moves across the sky. 
Yeah, you have moments of a sensory experience that's observable, but you have not stared at the sky, at the sun for all 12 hours of the sun being out, you know, in a perfect world, right? And just stared at it the whole time and been like, yep, it is moving moment by moment from here to there. You, you haven't seen that incremental change. You're making an educated guess. But from that educated guess, there is conviction. And I think it's very important to understand that selflessness is subtle phenomena. It's not extremely subtle. Karma is extremely subtle, okay? So to understand karma is gonna take a lot more than to understand emptiness in a direct way. To understand it in an intellectual way, karma might be a lot easier to understand just intellectually what the Buddha said about it but to understand the spectrum and the nuance and the diversity of how causes and conditions, actions, their effects play out is actually very extremely subtle. Yeah. So we'll understand emptiness before we'll understand karma. Yeah. Interesting. So we'll come back to these concepts, but just to kind of get used to some of the words. Okay, and so then very obscure or extremely hidden phenomena. This is known by ordinary sentient beings by relying on inferential reliable cognizers by authoritative testimony. The attestation of someone who is, an, who is authoritative in that field. For example, we know our birthday by asking our mother, right? We understand the subtle intricacies of karma by depending on the Buddhist teachings. While atoms and subatomic particles are slightly obscure phenomena that can be known by inference, most of us rely on the testimony of scientists to know their existence and characteristics. So I think this last one is really easy for us to understand. Atoms and subatomic particles could be known by inference, but for us, they're not usually. For us, we know them because of scientists, and we trust scientists because of a whole series of reasons which are useful to unpack. So how do we understand extremely hidden phenomena? Through a good source. That's at our level. Eventually, we will be able to understand extremely hidden phenomena directly. But for us, we need to understand who is trustworthy. And it becomes difficult because, you know, how can you say? So if you were to say, I trust the Buddha, how come? <laughs> what makes him trustworthy? He's not going to be offended if we have this conversation. We should have this conversation. Why is the Buddha a valid being? Why should we believe anything he says? I would say that one, he asks us to test everything that he's teaching us. So that implies an inherent trustworthiness because he's not asking us to believe something based solely on faith. And then second, because we know a lot of people in our life today who have worked with the Buddhist teachings more extensively than, than we have where we are right now. And um, their teachings have helped us understand the Buddhist teachings. So there's like a reciprocal relationship there. So we can kind of say, well, these people know more than I do and what mm. they're teaching me matches up. So yeah. maybe Buddha's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like an informed trust, what you're describing. It's not a blind faith. It's an informed trust, but there is still a little bit of a faith there. That's, you know, I can't quite prove anything yet. So I need to rely on human being and other human beings and you know, that's still tricky and problematic, but I think what you're saying is really important, um, particularly if someone says, check for yourself, it implies a level of confidence that what can be checked, they'll come to the same conclusions. Yeah, check my work. Yes, if you do this meditation and this meditation for this amount of time in this way, it will lead to this, but you don't have to take my word for it. It implies a confidence, yeah, and so that's, it could be a bluff though, right? He could be bluffing. He could say, I could just pretend to be confident like this, but really who knows what'll happen? Just, you know, <laughs> off you go, right? But I think it can help to ask yourself, if you were a Buddha, how would you be? 
if you were a Buddha, how would you be? Would you want to lead people astray? Would you want to hurt people? Would you want to fool people? Would you want to lie to people? We're nice people, right? Right now already, we're not Buddhas. We're just regular people who are sort of nice, trying to do the best we can, a little bit full of it, a little bit vague and confused, but generally, you know, we're friendly, right? We don't want to hurt people. We don't want to lead people astray. How much more so if this mind was fully developed? How much more so if our afflictions were under control and gone? How much more so if we didn't have any ignorance whatsoever obscuring our mind? Would we suddenly revert <laughs> and become really unkind? That doesn't make sense, right? So, so sometimes putting yourself in the, in the shoes of the Buddha and imagining if you had all of those qualities, what would you want for people? That can help. But as you say, the testing process, right? Take what makes sense logically at your level and test it enough and you see it works, yeah? And that kind of testing gives you faith that the things that you can't prove as quickly are probably true. So you're still gonna try and prove them to yourself experientially, but you're giving yourself more time and patience to kind of see how it plays out because the things that are more immediate have actually worked out quite successfully. Yeah. And as you say, you look at people further along the path um, or more learned or whatever, and you think, yeah, they seem to be, you know, getting better at life <laughs> in terms of their everyday happiness, in terms of their everyday friendliness. Maybe their financial choices become strange, but otherwise they seem to be getting better, right? <laughs> so we're still referencing that, that logic. We're still using our logic based on our own experience. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. We are. Yes, we are. Yeah. And it's okay. just, we have to, we have to hold what we understand about like confirmation bias. And we have to look at logical fallacies. And we have to be very honest with ourselves that we're already ready to believe a whole number of things and disbelieve a whole number of things before we come across more logic and more information. We're already kind of preemptively gonna believe something and not believe something else. We have to acknowledge our own biases going into the fact. And what we want to do rather than pretend we don't have biases is try and have more useful biases that are more informed with the best logic we can bring to it. Yeah. And there's a reason why we believe scientists and it's because we studied science when we were little kids somewhat. And we saw the process that they go through to come to certain theories. And we understand the mechanisms involved in when they finally make a more finite statement. But science is just as much of a belief system as any religion. There are things that they have proved and then a hundred years later disproved or evolved from or deepened. You know, to say that science is like superior logically than all religions, depends on who the scientist is, depends on who the religious practitioner is, right? So we have to, you know, really examine our own belief systems with some objectivity and just kind of check, okay, some of that, I just like the idea of it. That's why I believe it. It seems nice. And you think, okay, that's not as sophisticated of you. And I want to work on that. However, I acknowledge that's why I believe that. It just seems really nice. And then this one, I actually believe based in trial and error, and I've seen that it is true. So actually I'm doing good on that topic, whatever it is, yeah? But you just kind of keep coming back to things that are harder to understand like karma. You, one, look at the Buddha as being an authoritative being because the things that are immediately provable, you've worked on proving them to yourself. But also you ask yourself, what's the implication of living this way? If this is true, what would change in my behavior? And would that be positive and beneficial for myself and the world? If the law of karma is true, what would make my, what would happen with my behavior? Would it be kinder? Would it be more compassionate? Would it be more careful? And is there a benefit to that? So you can look at it from a lot of different perspectives to give yourself momentum to keep 
experimenting. And then kind of take the pressure off of feeling like you need to have really rock solid conclusions. It's more like you start having trends of assumption that are more and more conditioned with logic. Right now we assume compassion is an essential way to live. And that's a valid assumption, but we keep reinforcing it with more logic, more experience, more reasoning. It's gonna stick more and go deeper and permeate more aspects of our life than if we just kind of hold it as, that's something I believe but never examine. Do you agree? Yeah, something I, I, I think that's true, but I never really look at why I think that or how to play, how that plays out or how to deepen it. But yeah, compassion's good. You kind of take it for granted that it's your belief system and then you yell at your spouse. Yeah, it's interesting to look at these things. So we're looking at the different kinds of phenomena as kind of a gateway at looking at what kinds of consciousness are accurate and valid and which ones aren't. Okay, so there's the three types of phenomena that are known by specific types of reliable cognizers. So there's direct reliable cognizers, factual reliable cognizers, and inferential reliable cognizers by authoritative testimony. Okay, so we'll come back to these ideas. So don't feel like you need to remember them. We'll come back to them. And this is part of the discussion of the seven types of awareness found in Lorig. But just to kind of keep it tidy for now. So it's the direct reliable cognizers that can apprehend evident or manifest phenomena. The factual ones apprehend slightly obscure phenomena. The inferential ones by authoritative testimony apprehend very obscure ones. And this is all descriptions related to ordinary sentient beings, not arias, not the people that have realized emptiness directly. For an aria, subtle impermanence and selflessness are evident phenomena. They're manifest to them. Whereas for us, they're slightly obscure. So there are no obscure objects for Buddhas because they are omniscient. So even in terms of ordinary sentient beings, there's some variation also. So it's, it's an important sidestep to say that the prasangikas describe evident and obscure phenomena differently. They say that evident objects are those that can be known through our own experience without depending on inference. For example, sense objects. Obscure objects must initially be known by depending on a reason. They are objects of inference. For example, the subtle impermanence of the body and the selflessness of the person. So the middle way consequence school view, the prasangika view is the highest view philosophically, but the lower schools actually describe the mind in a more tidy way. So this can be a little confusing and it's just important to name it so we don't get too tangled. So this hierarchical schema of the four schools, the four tenant schools of Buddhist philosophy, there's the Vibhashika, the great exposition, the Sautrantika, the Sutra school, Yogacharya, the mind only school, and the Madhyamaka, the middle way school, and there's some branches. So the Madhyamaka school, particularly the Prasangikas, the consequentialist school, is traditionally considered the highest because its critiques of essentialism are said to yield the most accurate account of what truly exists. But the models of mind and cognition endorsed by the Madhyamaka are drawn almost entirely from the three lower schools, namely the last two. So this is where we're getting this information from. Okay, so most of the descriptions about minds and mental factors are from the Abhidhamma Kosha, and that is more deeply delved into by the lower schools. The lower schools explain the mind much more clearly, much more specifically. So rather than the consequentialists kind of coming up with their own system, they use the lower school system. So we just can kind of leave that conversation at that, but it's an important distinction to know if you're someone who's also studying tenants, that there might be a couple instances when we're talking about the mind where there's a little bit of a philosophical difference between the tenant schools, okay? But for now, what we're really wanting to ask ourselves is how do I know when what I'm thinking is true or not? And true from what criteria? 
And I think one of the most important takeaways I want you to hold from this evening is to understand the nature of an affliction, okay? An affliction or a disturbing emotion. The simplest definition is that which disturbs the mind. An affliction is that which disturbs the mind. So if your mind is feeling disturbed, there's going to be at least some level of inaccuracy in your thinking. There's a problem in your thinking. Now, of course, we always have innate ignorance. <laughs> That's a problem all the time, all day, every day. And we'll keep coming back to that again and again. But in terms of your everyday rational mind, if the mind is agitated, there's something problematic. Try not to make choices from that place, <laughs> okay? And again, this can be really difficult because sometimes it's the agitated mind that makes you kind of look at what's happening in your life more critically and ask important questions. So we're not saying that negative states of mind can't be useful in some way, but only if we're looking at them through the vision of wisdom. If we're taking a vivid experience as our criteria for truth, that becomes very problematic. And that's a way of thinking that actually some forms of psychology seem to promote. If it feels big, if it feels important, if it's a strong emotion, there must be truth to it. And afflictions are not truth. Yeah. So when there's that agitated quality of the mind, you don't want to suppress it. You don't want to deny it. You don't want to pretend it's not there. But don't believe everything it's telling you. That nice, clear, reflective capacity of your mind, like a mountain lake, has become like a pot of boiling water. And reality is even more distorted than normally. It's all boiling. It's lost its clarity. Yeah, so reliable, unreliable cognizers, these strange words, we'll kind of get used to them. But right now for today, start really asking yourself, how do I know when I'm at least more or less reasonable, more or less in alignment with relative truth at the very least. And part of that is being able to capture when you know an afflictive experience is happening within you. Yeah, I'm, I'm hung up on using the sun moving across the sky as an example of slightly obscure phenomena and how we convince ourselves or how we know that the sun is moving across the sky when in reality, we know from Copernicus that the sun is not moving across the sky, the earth is revolving, and that it's actually the earth moving under the sun, the sun is stationary. And my what I'm wondering is, is that intentional, that irony? Is that in, intended to show us that that means of knowing subtle, uh, or, or a subtly obscure phenomena are not are also not necessarily reliable <laughs> because yeah because it's a very it's a very important point yes and I'm sure quite a few of you were hung up on that of like wait a minute I know it looks that way but that's not even what it's happening <laughs> Copernicus <laughs> right <laughs> so you'd have to ask the author why they use that particular example. Um, but I think that there is a way to read it very much as you said um, and whether it's the sun moving across the sky or whether we're talking about the more accurate uh, complex scientific view that explain that um, scientists have come to understand through any number of calculations in either case we actually don't know it directly is the point right so it's an example of something that we don't know directly we only know through calculations through reasoning through things that are not immediately observable to the eye Right, that's kind of what we're talking about. It's not manifest to our senses, despite us seeing obvious change in the position. And are not necessarily reliable. So those are not necessarily reliable cognizers. No, the cognition, what we're talking about is phenomena that are slightly obscure and the cognitions that can penetrate them. Okay, so don't get lost in the analogy. It's just that author's analogy. What we're talking about is that some things we can know directly, that still doesn't mean accurately. Okay. Yeah, yeah, manifest phenomena. Just because we can see it directly doesn't mean we know it accurately. So someone could like throw an apple at your head and you have a visceral feeling and you could think it was an orange, not an apple. 
but you had a direct experience of a manifest phenomena, but it doesn't mean you've understood it accurately. Yeah, or all of the karma that made it happen, et cetera, et cetera. For slightly obscure phenomena, uh, similarly, like there's the phenomena and then there's the mind that apprehends it. And what makes us call it obscure is the mind observing it. Yeah, not the phenomena itself, because the phenomena itself isn't more or less obscure to a Buddha, a mind without obscurations. So it's, it's kind of, it's a tricky gymnastics in your mind of is the phenomena so obscure or is the mind problematic? And it depends on who we're talking about, who's having the experience. Yeah, so yeah, so don't get lost in the analogy and, and you're quite right, that analogy is problematic. Um, and it's very cute that you pointed that out and now I'm gonna be stuck on it and find another analogy that's much better. But um, yeah, it's a good point, it's a good point really use, use emptiness, yeah, as your best example for an obscure phenomena, and use karma as your best example for extremely obscure phenomena. Yeah, um, let's see, yeah, Glacier, Joanne's putting in the chat, maybe a glacier would be a better example. Yeah, we know it's melting, but we're not seeing the melt. <laughs> yes, or now we are, it's become manifest. It used to be obscure, now it's manifest. Yeah. Any any other thoughts or particular things you want to make sure that we cover in this course? Parts well, the, of, um, the analogy yeah. of the sun worked for me because I just thought, yes, it seems that way, but we have to use reasoning to figure out what's really going on. Like with yeah, yeah, exactly. Un innumerable things in our life. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the piece to come to is... Um, what sort of things can you only know through reasoning as opposed to what are the things that you have to know through experience? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I don't want to like belabor the conversation about the analogy. I do have a question based on previous teachings. Would it be similar to talk about the teaching where in the distance we see what we think is a snake, but then upon approaching it, we realize it's actually a rope? Is that the same yeah, kind of experience that, we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, that analogy is usually talked about in the context of, of understanding the influence of ignorance and how we perceive things. But, um, but you, could, you okay. could use it if it's working for you. Right. Yeah, you could use it if it's working for you. Okay, thank and, you for that clarification. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Would anyone want to add anything? Actually, we don't have quite enough time for a sit this evening, but I'll make sure we do um, some clarity of mind meditation and some introductory Mahamudra meditation during this course. So um, I'm mostly going to be doing the first hour talking and then the last half hour um, mostly sitting. And um, we'll just be play it by ear. But yes, Nay, go ahead. I wanted to clarify a definition that I've heard and I still don't get right, which is um, the definition of existence, like if it's knowable, if mm -hmm. it exists, if it's a knowable. And yeah. I think to myself, but I can create all kinds of things in my mind that are knowable to me. I can come up with speeches that, you know, oh, so, and so I can say in one sense it exists because it's knowable, but in a sense, other sense also it doesn't exist. So I'm, don't know how to work with that. Yeah, okay, that's a good one. I'll, I'll put that on the let's talk about it next week list because that's a really important one. I'm glad you brought it up. And for those of you that don't know what she's referencing, the usual definition of an existence is that which is known by valid cognition, right? And so then you think, all right, but the horns of a rabbit don't exist, but I can picture them in my mind, but you can't picture them in your mind based in all sorts of criteria. So existence is a really good one to unpack. So that's going, that's going on the list. <laughs> that's going on the list. Do you want anything else on the list? And one more thing for the wish list, which also I can't uh, sort out in my head, which is, you know, the definition of omniscience. Like when right. we, when we uh, it's just, so okay, could, existence and omniscience, they're on the list. Okay. Yeah, because you know, sometimes you I hear the definition is that for a Buddha, it means that the two truths can be known simultaneously. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't I don't even know how to approach that. 
Yeah, yeah, well, omniscience is, an, is a fun topic to go into, so we can talk about omniscience for sure, but the, the short clarification for everybody tonight is don't equate omniscience with omnipotence, right? So while Buddhas do have power, wisdom, compassion, power, all those things, they can't sort of pull someone out of suffering and plunk them into happiness, you know, um, it's... They're, they're limited by our karma. They are not limited, but they're limited by our karma. So it's like we are being flooded by love, affection, support every minute of every day by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but we are not always able to experience or feel that due to the limitations of our own mind so far. So um, Buddhas are all knowing, but not all powerful in that sense of going beyond our karma. Um, like that. Oh, yes. So Tenzin's asking about reading materials. Um, yes, I will make you a recommended reading list, but uh, let's see. The hard to get, probably only found on eBay, is Mind and Its Functions by Geshe Rapton. Mind and Its Functions, Geshe Rapton. Um, <laughs> you might, but you probably can find it at your friendly local Dharma Center in their library. Um, a really easy book to find, which is very excellent, is uh, The Foundation of Buddhist Practice by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Tupton Children. Came out a couple of years ago, and it's really excellent. And that's where some of the quotes I was using today came from. And then um, for advanced students, you guys who have been studying this topic a long time, there's this new series by Geshe Jimpa. Um, and it's I think it's called the science and philosophy. Let me just find it here. I have it right on my little Kindle. Yes, science and philosophy in the Indian Buddhist classics. Volume two is all about the mind. So reviewing what we talked about today, if there's not um, questions, just very briefly, um, we're looking at different kinds of phenomena and different kinds of mind. That's gonna, we'll keep coming up to that. But remember what we talked about, about clarity and awareness, okay? So the mind being reflective. Um, we only briefly talked about the difference between minds and mental factors. We'll keep coming back to that. But understand that um, minds are the main thing that we talk about in terms of clarity and awareness, but mental factors are also clear and knowing. It's just that mental factors are kind of what give description and vividness and coloring to our mental experience. Some of them are useful, some of them are not useful. So, you know, for example, compassion is a mental factor. And when it enters the mind, it is mind, but when it enters the mind, it influences the rest of the main minds. For example, if you have compassion for someone, they look different to your eyes than if you have anger towards someone. We already know this experientially, right? Like someone we don't like, even if they're conventionally attractive, we don't like the look of them, right? We're like, ah, your stupid face, right? <laughs> even if they're conventionally just incredibly beautiful, if we're angry, they look ugly to us. If we have a loving mind, then who we're having a loving mind towards looks beautiful to us. Even if they have a weird wonky face, we think it's beautiful and endearing and we love the sight of it. Right? We already know that experientially, right? So there's this influence of the mental factors color the main minds. And that's that kind of sky and clouds analogy that we'll keep coming back to. But let it brew. And um, as it brews, see if you come up with any questions that you've been having about consciousness and I can try and weave them into the lesson plan. So I really appreciate you guys coming along tonight and thanks for your patience with all the technical difficulties. And we'll go ahead and dedicate. Janchu Semcho Rimpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Yuchi Ke Pan Yam Pa Me Pa Yi Gon He Gon Du Pa Toni Dawa Rimpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Yuchi Ke Pan Yam Pa Me Pa Yi Bone Gondu Pawa Show. And may all of our teachers have long life and teach us until samsara ends. <laughs> <laughs>